Have we had a good day so far? All right. That's what we're talking about. So, for me, this has been a phenomenal day. Um, I probably am not going to live through the rest of it, but oh, we'll make it. Um, but we started off on a real high note because we had the governor here, we had Annie Lamont, and I thought it really set an amazing tone for the, the course of the day. Now, an, what you guys don't know is that we had this whole day planned out the way it was going to be with the weather and everything else anyway, so <laughs> it was all in the cards. But we did plan certain things to be a certain way, and one was to have the last talk by the speaker I'm going to introduce in a moment. And the reason I did it is because it's the end of a day, and we start to get tired and all those kinds of things, and I wanted energy. I wanted excitement. I wanted to bring it because that's what this is all about. If we don't get serious and really start getting engaged, none of this happens. But what I've seen all day is that energy, and what I intended by having Kate be the last speaker was to really top it off. Now, I'm really building this up, and I apologize for that, <laughs> but I know she's up for it. And frankly, I don't do introductions because I hate reading bios, and if you were here this morning, you saw how bad I am at reading bios, so I don't do that. I'm going to introduce Kate because, one, she has been um, life science investing in the European theater for a long time. Um, she is considered one of the grand dames of the business, and deservedly so. She's run huge funds that have been hugely successful, not only in delivering returns, but in terms of delivering drugs to the market, which is, at the end of the day, what we're all about. Um, and she's been extraordinarily good at it. Now, there are certain parts of her life, however, that she hasn't been as good at. I mean, educationally, she went to Oxford, and then she went to that other, got an MBA at that other school that's up in Massachusetts. <laughs> but, but she and her husband had the good sense to at least have her son come to the right school, <laughs> where he is on the crew here. Absolutely. So at least we have that. Um, but I really, I want to uh, welcome uh, Kate here because one, this is a real opportunity to look at one of the visionaries uh, who's looking over the, the uh, horizon at the next generation of, of biotech uh, life science opportunities that are out there. I've met with her. We've talked about what she was going to say. She's actually very worried about what she's going to say. I'm telling you, you're going to really be entertained and you're going to learn a heck of a lot in a very short time. So would you please join me in welcoming Kate Bingham. Well, I can only go downhill, I think, after that introduction. So, um, thank you very much. So, I um, have had a fabulous trip. Um, I came over from London. I landed um, yesterday at about, well, I got into, into New Haven about one in the morning. So, I have just about um, adjusted and, and got onto, um, onto the right schedule. And we had a great time. So, yesterday we spent the day um, in the Boyer Center of Molecular Medicine um, working with current collaborators as well as potential future collaborators. And I have two great entrepreneurs. Where's Zavan and Dave? Are they here in the room? There we are, wave, there we are. Um, these, are these are actually people who do know what they're doing, um, unlike me. Um, and then today, fantastic. I mean, I've, I've been meeting old friends, I've been uh, making new ones, and I just hear nothing but ambition and energy and excitement. And probably for those of you who, who have been following the, the um, announcements, there was a $830 million announcement about a, a new neuroscience center that's opening up, um, that's just been announced, which should open up in the next few years, um, combining hospital right on top of medical research. So in terms of the scale and scope of what uh, we see is, is really coming out of Yale, specifically in neuroscience, which we're heavily focused on, we think is incredibly exciting. So thank you for inviting me. Great um, uh, experience for all of us, so thank you. And the good news is you said I would be um, done quite quickly, and that is true, because I speak quickly, and I know I'm the last um, uh, speaker before we get on to the prizes and the reception. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about financial and social returns. So... Uh, tell you a little bit about how we work and what we've done and uh, what, what are the, some of the outcomes of what we've done. So, 
Um, SV, we are, we've been around forever, as John suggested. I actually joined in 91, so I think I am a statistic for being in the same uh, job for a long time. We changed name uh, from Schroeder Ventures to where we are now, SV. Um, and we've invested um, with my partners across different, all the different sectors in life sciences. All I do is, is drugs. Uh, it's a good dinner party conversation to say that's what I do. Um, and primarily I've been in, um, investing out of Europe. Um, we have just announced actually, just as a, as a side, um, that we're working now uh, with Cancer Research UK, which despite the, um, the name actually funds Harvard, Stanford, maybe Yale soon to come, um, and MIT. Um, and actually in terms of the sorts of things we do, we are highly collaborative um, and working very closely with academic institutions to think about how can we translate some of the basic um, uh, academic insights and thinking about how can we um, develop new drugs. So the team is here. I have Human, who is exactly what everybody wants in a venture capitalist. So an MD, PhD, focused everywhere from genetics, basic science, through to experimental therapeutics. So can read the papers, talk to academics, and really figure out how do their insights actually translate to a drug that can help patients um, and have an impact on, on their disease. Uh, and Mike Ross, who was the 10th employee at Genentech, um, and there is very little he doesn't know about uh, biological uh, therapeutics. So we manage different funds. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Dementia Fund. We manage a public fund um, and then six different venture funds. And the only way we can make this work is by having venture partners who are amazing, um, operating, innovating uh, uh, entrepreneurs. So these are people with scientific backgrounds, with clinical backgrounds and commercial. They often help conceive of company um, ideas and new approaches to treat disease um, and then go in as existing management. So uh, Mike Solomon on the right hand side is uh, um, as we talked about, he is the, he's the CEO of Ribometrics, the company we have in, in North Carolina with Hatteras. Um, but all of, these com all of these individuals have set up companies, we've backed them, and they are grown-ups. So they absolutely know what they're doing and uh, are fabulous. I mean, it, they are just brilliant. And what we did um, la launch last year was... Uh, I mean, it, this was a big ask, a dementia discovery fund. So it's a 15 year venture fund aimed at finding disease modifying drugs for dementia. And we have explicitly said we're not going to focus on um, the amyloid beta pathway because we think that's been well uh, drilled by, by other people. Um, so finding investors for this fund was uh, uh, a interesting uh, challenge um, and we ended up um, actually with a fund twice as big as we expected it to be so once we were actually able to put the team together and the team again are what I think of as card carrying neuroscientists so these are people who really understand this very complicated um, space for investing um, and as you can see we, we pulled in some pretty interesting uh, uh, investors, largely strategic in some form, and I, I put in extra big font the NFL players because I thought you guys would all enjoy that. Um, uh, we had Gates, we had a two, something like two hour due diligence meetings with Bill Gates himself, and we were told not to dumb it down. So we were told that treat him as a neuroscience professor because that's how he'll come across, and that's how he did come across. So this is an interesting fund because it's a 15 year venture fund, and it gives us that much more time to actually start testing testing hypotheses in what is an area, obviously, that has, has uh, completely failed so far. Um, so I'll give you some examples about what we've done. And this is actually the uh, slide I'm most proud of. So over the course of our um, time investing in, in biotech, um, both sides of the Atlantic, Europe as well as um, in the US, um, clearly we're still in business. So that means we've delivered returns back to our investors and investors have carried on um, supporting our funds. But actually this is the slide that I think is uh, the most exciting. So it's a sort of schematic to say on the left hand side, the, dr the drugs that got to market um, are the um, typically sort of treating the symptoms of disease. Um, and as you go to the, towards the right hand side, you start to see more disease control um, and cure. But what I think is uh, interesting is we've, we've um, invested in companies or in these, in these drugs 
um, that have now opened up six new drug classes. So what that does uh, for patients is creates a much bigger choice of drugs. So one of the, the challenges, and if you look at Macugen um, halfway down, that was the first VEGF inhibitor to treat uh, macular degeneration. Um, and as you will know, that is now a booming, thriving market. Macrogen was not the best drug, but it was the first drug to get out there, and it gave confidence to other um, pharma companies, Regeneron, Genentech, and so on, to come in and actually optimize and come up with better drugs for patients. So for us, that was a phenomenal um, financial return for us um, in, in um, the, the investment in, in iTech. But, but for patients, they now have a selection of different drugs um, to, to uh, use for their treatment. And you can see uh, other examples of what we have helped invest and that have got to market or near to market. So I'm just going to do a quick snapshot on the market to then inform why we invest and how we uh, think about some of the uh, the themes that, that um, we use for our fund. So we, I think everyone knows this. We've been in a raging bull market in the uh, public markets now for some time. Um, and you can see it's vastly outperformed um, the S&P 500. We've had ups and downs, but nevertheless, it's still a very punchy performance. And it's driven by what we've talked about today. So this golden age of, of scientific uh, development and advances. I mean, there's been both both fundamental understanding of biology, as well as new formats, new approaches, and just enormous creative innovation, thinking about how to tackle disease. Um, and that's combined with computing. So as we start thinking about these very large data sets and these abilities to sequence and do single cell in ways that we've never been able to do, that coming together has really enabled the waterfront of new drug discovery to, to be much, much broader than it's ever been before. And so here's the, some stats on, on the public market valuations. So you can see I, IPO valuations largely going up. IP's proce the, the proceeds raised largely going up. So again, this is this is been a very buoyant time. Um, and as a result, actually M&A has come down a bit because the, the, the stock prices have been forcing the, the prices too, much, too high to actually allow for a, um, a really vibrant M&A. So where we are seeing M&A, they tend to be quite, quite back-end loaded. But nevertheless, that, that is a, a core exit, um, certainly for our companies in Europe, until we can uh, get the same sorts of public markets as we have over here. But what is interesting is that the, the changing shape of M&A that we see when pharma companies are buying some of these small innovative biotech companies is there's been a massive shift to, for pharma to start buying and getting in uh, to companies earlier. Um, so you can see the, the bottom two um, bars, the, the uh, preclinical and phase one, uh, now represent the majority of the acquisitions that we're seeing um, most recently um, or as of last year. So earlier acquisitions to, to fill pipelines and start generating growth. Um, and so in terms of the trends that we're seeing in the market which inform how we invest, there are three key ones. Precision medicine, and this really gets to the, the, the topic of combining these biological advances with um, the, co the computing power and the data sets that allow you to both define the, the basis of, of uh, in individual's disease as well as identify those patients um, who, could, who could respond to that disease. I'm going to talk a little bit about social impact because that is a theme I'm hearing a lot from investors, uh, which I think rightly was, we're seeing an increased investor push to how they allocate their funds into different funds. Um, and then um, company creation is a theme for us as to how do we maximize the potential investment returns we can make as we invest. So this is an interesting uh, case study. So we were founding investors in a um, company called Qdos in the old Cambridge, Cambridge, UK, uh, with a professor, Steve Jackson. And we funded them to do um, a DNA damage response uh, drug discovery, so looking at different forms of DNA repair inhibitors. And we built up a series of, of uh, preclinical and, and earlier stage discovery compounds and developed Alaparib, or what became Alaparib. And so after we just had some early clinical data, we sold the company to AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca then took it into a bunch of different studies and uh, eventually said, you know what, it doesn't work. And, and what was then fascinating was Pfizer then made a, uh, uh, 
hostile bid for, for AZ, and then they had to relook at all, you know, to try and figure out how to defend uh, the, the potential um, hostile bid. And so they relooked at their Alaprib data. And what was interesting is when we sold it, Alaprib is exquisitely aimed at patients with BRCA uh, mutations. And when um, AZ put it into all comer studies in Avarian, Lo and behold, um, uh, there were uh, all the patients without the BRCA mutations that didn't respond. When they went back in to look at it, they then uh, found that actually those patients with the genetic background responded beautifully. They went to the FDA and got accelerated approval. So I've given this as an example because it's been a beautiful uh, exemplification of how, we're, how we are seeing precision medicine really starting to become central to everything that we all invest in. So there is no, we don't invest in ovarian cancer drugs anymore. We, we don't in, invest in breast cancer. We invest in HER2 positive or triple negative. We start to stratify the patients um, according to the, the underlying mechanism of disease. Um, and that's how we continue to invest. And we can do that um, with some of the resources that are available in the UK. And, and I've just put up a selection here. Um, the UK is never going to be an attractive commercial market. You know, the NHS is a sing single payer, paid for by the government, and it's just cheaper not to give anybody any drugs, basically, almost ever. <laughs> but uh, what, what, what we do have as, as a, a potential um, opportunity is every single person in the UK has a NHS number. And that means we have medical records, which are now largely electronic, which um, can be aggregated and interrogated. So HDR UK is um, an initiative that basically combines all the hospital records in the UK. So that's diagnostics, bloods, urine, imaging, plus um, all, the, all the, the broader diagnostics. Genomics England is 100,000 patients that's now um, scaling up um, of fully genotyped patients with rare diseases or different forms of cancer. So again, a scale that is uh, really pretty punchy when you're starting to think about, well, how can we identify some of these patients? Biobank is really interesting. That is half a million, uh, you know, volunteers who've signed up to be intensively monitored for the rest of their lives for the sake of uh, scientific advance. So again, very uh, detailed, longitudinal data. And so these people, um, you know, the 69-year-olds, who were not necessarily patients when they signed up in 2008, are now likely to be um, presenting with some forms of symptoms and so on. So again, now we've got some longitudinal data that allows you to go back and say, right, you've got a diagnosis now in 2018. What could we have done to actually identify um, that that progression of that disease earlier. So starting to think about how do you how can you identify those patients and how can you start to interrogate some of the um, drives, drives of disease. I've also put in you won't be able to see this um, East London Healthcare is one of our um, investors actually. This is one and a half million uh, patients from from primary care all the way through to tertiary care in a highly diverse part of East London. So again, the, the, the scope of these electronic medical records allow us to really start to think about how can we be much more intelligent about um, defi defining disease mechanisms, developing drugs against those disease mechanisms, and then identifying patients. And uh, conveniently, I said on our UK government's life science um, strategy board, so we're well positioned to actually see how these are working and how to how to work with them so on social impact this is something that's kind of interesting that it's coming from investors um, as well as things that actually I think we all believe in which is we shouldn't be doing this if we're not going to make a sub substantial difference to patients lives but what we've got here is a series of initiatives that investors are now signing up to and really want to to hear from the um, the funds that they are investing in, how are we addressing some of these, these topics? So sustainable development goals are, are UN goals that, that talk about how across the whole landscape of health and poverty and housing and gender and balance and work and life and so on. And so these are all things that we are now starting to incorporate much more formally into um, our lives of how do we set up companies, how do we um, impose the sorts of values that we think are important into the um, philosophies of our companies. And so we're now starting to report 
to our investors the sorts of impacts that we are generating through the investments we made. So, I mean, we've got some examples of companies here, of, of drugs here, of, you know, how many patients are we treating, what are the, the um, survival benefits or... or um, quality of life benefits that we can deliver. And so again, this is very interesting that investors, financial investors in our funds are now starting to want uh, non-financial reporting in addition to financial reporting as to how we are contributing. Um, and so this uh, is a third theme um, for us, which is we're spending a lot of time looking at really interesting science, trying to tackle uh, new diseases with a very clear goal that we want to uh, develop new drugs that are durable um, and uh, successful and will actually go, get to market. Um, and so what we found over the last uh, 20 years or so is, I guess not very surprising, if you set up the company yourself, you will end up with a bigger equity ownership um, than if you go in somebody else's deal at Series B or Series C. Um, and so if we are, um, end up, if we set up the companies to begin with, our view is we will end up with better returns, and lo and behold, that is exactly what happens. And so I've, I've given some logos of some of the companies we've set up over the last two or three years. Oof, yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a great range of uh, companies from Onc to Neuro to uh, Inflammation. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, quite a lot of different ranges of companies here. And the way we work with um, academics uh, and, and our universities is we try and bring the KOLs in uh, right at the beginning so that they can help us shape um, the companies. And so this is what we were doing yesterday with some of the hypothesis testing we're doing now in, in the field of dementia is really who else is making the contributions? How else could we be interrogating this particular pathways? What can we learn from other areas of science that, that can help us uh, make these successful? And so that means we will typically have the academics as core founders uh, on day one um, as we set up the company. Um, more or less involved in what the company is doing according to, to stage. And also we find it's a phenomenal deal flow opportunity. So where we're working with academics, and we're talking to them about whichever company uh, they've helped co-found, uh, the best um, uh, discussions is when they say to, to us is, you know, do you have half an hour just at the end of the meeting? Because I've got some new data I want to just share with you. It's got nothing to do with um, what we've been talking about, but I'd love to get your views on it. Now, that is the sort of thing um, which we really like because that gives you a, a, a absolutely ground floor view of, of new science as it's coming um, out of the lab. So that, we find, is exciting. So we have a strong emphasis on that. And this is the example, actually, of, a, of something we're doing at the moment with Yale, um, uh, which I've called a, a translational collaboration, where we're looking at lysosomal trafficking in, in uh, dementia. So there's good evidence in uh, patients, in rodents, we've got some good models, starting to think about this, this clear dysfunction that's, that's um, seen in, in different forms of dementia patients, where here in Yale, there are the world-leading experts who, who can actually start to think about how can you interrogate these pathways and how can you drug them. And this particular opportunity came up actually at an SAB meeting with um, our investors from the Dementia Fund, where we actually invited Pietro to come in and inform, talk to us all about how what was the state of the art and what was the best, what was the understanding in this whole field? And we literally, in a whiteboard at the meeting, started to think about how might we drug it. And that is that sort of creativity that we find so um, exciting and allow us to test out um, hypotheses, which then, if successful, we can then um, uh, uh, turn, into, turn into companies and, and fund much more substantially. So we've put in nearly $3 million so far, which is, I, it will be small, but if it's successful, we'll be getting to sort of, you know, 20, 30 million bucks. So hot areas, we've talked a little bit about this um, from some of the panels before. As always, oncology is the poster child here, and this is um, uh, the statistics from US invest, um, investments um, um, in 2017. Um, but you can see oncology nearly half the, the field. So. Actually, I disagreed with one of the panelists today who said that um, their pick in, air, in uh, places to invest was IO. I don't think IO is an easy place for, for venture to invest anymore. Um, 
unless you can happen to get a single agent that is really exceptional. Because I think it's such a busy space at the moment that trying to find a competitive niche and really show you're differentiated, I think it'd be quite tough. So we'll ha we have a little bit, um, and we're doing, we're doing work um, in, in manipulating different parts of the immune system. But actually, we're looking at a whole bunch of other sort of more orthogonal approaches, whether it's synthetic lethality or um, even cancer vaccines, which we've got some very interesting uh, uh, approach based on fossilized, what, what I think of as junk DNA. But human endogenous retroviruses is something that we think is interesting. Um, neurology, it remains central to what we're doing. Again, it's much less central to um, the industry generally. So you can see while it's increased, um, it's not increased as much as, as ONC. Um, and there's a reason. I mean, if you look at this data here, um, you can see that uh, the actual the performance of neuroscience investments has been poor. So uh, it, if you look at the returns you can make, um, in other areas, you can't, you can't make that, or you haven't historically made that uh, same investment in neuro. So we actually think, in a, in a, in a camp cyclical way, this is the time to invest in neuroscience. We've got a very clear roadmap as to how you can start thinking about stratifying patients and, and, and developing precision medicine in oncology. We'd like to basically start seeing that come through in, in neurology too. Um, and so in the, with the Dementia Fund, the sorts of things that are the, are the big challenges is, you know, we can't uh, uh, do biopsies, we can't do the same sort of uh, manipulation on the human brain, we don't have many biomarkers, uh, it's difficult to stratify and limited models. So there's a lot of things that make it a difficult area to invest in. Um, and so one of the things we are spending a lot of time thinking about is, how can we apply learnings from other clinical areas, whether it's oncology, inflammation, immunology, metabolism, and start thinking about are there processes and mechanisms and potential tool drugs or opportunities that we can apply into different forms of dementia that uh, doesn't mean we have to start um, and reinvent the wheel from, from scratch. So that's some, some of the things we're thinking about. And these are some of the themes specifically in dementia that we are focusing on. And when I say we're focusing on it, that means we have teams dedicated to really knowing everybody who is doing anything material in these, in these four key areas. So they're big buckets, microglial biology, um, synaptic physiology and function, membrane trafficking, and this that, attract, that addresses some of the lysosomal trafficking, and then mitochondrial uh, dynamics. Um, and so these are, these are companies and, pro and projects we've invested in over the last few years. Um, but also, we have a, a bucket for everything else. What, for everything else where we think there are big opportunities, but we won't necessarily um, be going out sourcing new ideas. Those, those will be ones that, that we happen to, to come across, unlike the ones when we're really um, generating opportunities. And then, of course, there's the rest of everything else that's not ONC and not neuro. Um, and so here are some examples of things that uh, we've invested in. So again, the fundamental thesis is, can it have a significant impact on human health and on, on disease patients? Uh, Pulmicide, uh, for those of you who sat in on the, um, the pitch just now, um, we've got inhaled medicines uh, for treatment of uh, severe fungal infections in, of the, in the lung. And we've been getting compassionate use data. We're running normal clinical studies, as you expect. But we have a safe drug. We've, been, um, uh, we've allowed the drug to be used in compassionate use patients for cystic fibrosis patients who've had lung transplants and now have uh, lethal or near lethal um, lung infections. And, and in the first four patients that we've treated, we've cleared the lung infection. So it's, these are really substantial uh, improvements in, in um, patients' lives. Calvis is another example of a UK company we've actually brought over here, is now listed on NASDAQ, um, in uh, diabetic macular edema and rare disease, um, and in plasma calocrines. And then Avrobio, I'm sure many of you will know, is a gene therapy company focused again on, on rare disease. So we're happy to go across the different um, clinical areas. Um, and in, in places that many of the VCs won't go, won't, won't go to. And here is sort of my final summary of some of the hot areas of uh, oncology, neuro, underserved areas, and you know, some of the, the tools and the themes that we're thinking about when we, when we invest. 
But a comment that um, Annie made um, this morning I th really resonated with me, which was, what are we all doing in venture capital if we don't actually make a contribution to society? So that is my message to everybody here, is it's fine to, to make returns and, and be investors and be hard-nosed uh, negotiators when you start to think about how you're, you're setting up your deals and how you're taking companies public and selling them and so on. But actually, the real question that gets us out of bed every day is, what are we actually doing for patients, and can we actually show that what we're doing to, as, our, as part of our investment is actually leading to a, a long-term uh, impact on patients? And that's what um, uh, guides what we do. So thank you for having me. Thank you for putting up with me. And John, I'm going to hand over to you for the prizes. <laughs> I'm happy to do questions if anybody's got questions. Now we've got one person who definitely doesn't want to do questions. <laughs> Good, I think we're going to go on to prizes. Pleasure.